see on um, Zoom that you, we do have uh, live uh, captioning through the Zoom um, software running. So you can use that if you want the closed captioning, although we do acknowledge that that is uh, purely computer-based and is not perfect. Um, the recordings from today's session we will make available on our YouTube channel afterwards, uh, but we always manually caption everything after, so there might be a short delay uh, before we actually uh, have that posted up and ready for everybody. Um, I haven't introduced myself. Uh, my name is Darren Flynn, if you don't know me, and I'm one of the co-chairs of uh, Critical Approaches to Libraries Conference. Um, and I work on this conference with my colleague and my friend, uh, Michelle Bond, who you'll hear from in a little while. Um, this session um, we put on in lieu of our normal annual conference, and we've been doing a um, summer series of events instead. Um, you will see on our opening slide, very excitingly, our new logo um, that we've had designed um, for us, um, which we'll be using in future. Um, so I hope you like that. And if we go on to the next slide, please, Michelle. Thank you. So here's uh, the agenda for today. So there's a short intro from me. Um, we've then got our first of two sessions. Uh, let's not make a lib guide, how best practices can help us make better guides or empower us to let them go. Um, and we're really pleased to have joining us Ulla Lechtenberg uh, from the University of Pittsburgh Library. We've then got a short break in the afternoon and then we'll move on to our second session from our own uh, Michelle Bond, who's been talking, who's going to be talking to us about whether we still need reading lists or indeed reading list systems. And then we'll just uh, finish up the session with a close from Michelle. Just in terms of logistics for today's session, um, if anybody um, has any questions that they want to uh, raise for either the speakers or any discussion points to raise, you can use the chat to do that. Um, we'd appreciate it if it is a question, if you could start it off uh, with a big queue so that we can spot them really easily um, in the overall thread. So if you do it with a big queue and then a dash and then whatever your question is, like I've just demonstrated in the chat, and that just means we can pick out questions quickly. If you want to ask a question without it having attached to your name, you can private message uh, those questions to Michelle, although do be aware that as she's presenting, she's not going to be able to pick up those uh, as well, and it'll be only at the end. Um, the just in terms of safety for today's event, um, we do have a code of conduct that you should have received in your uh, reminder email for today's event, but I've also just posted uh, a link to that into the chat. Um, so that's in operation throughout this afternoon's event. Um, if you need to raise any issues um, where you feel there's been a breach of the code of conduct, there is options uh, within that code of conduct on the website to raise any issues, and you can also do that during the event. Although, again, be aware that some of us will be speaking during that, so we might not be able to immediately respond, but we certainly will um, get back to you as soon as we can. Okay, I think I've covered everything that I need to cover. Michelle, is there anything that I've missed out? Uh, not that I can think of, no. Excellent, right. Well, I actually managed to do my to-do list for my first five minutes of today's event. So with that, um, I'd like to pass on to um, Ulla, who's going to be uh, starting off with uh, her presentation. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you so much. Let me just get my slides set up here and we can get started. Um, Just a thumbs up if you can see my title slide. Okay, thank you, Taryn. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so yeah, thank you very much to Michelle and Darren for inviting me uh, to talk with uh, you all about our favorite, maybe least favorite platform lip guides. Um, I'd like to shout out uh, Twitter user Two Great Oaks for this great meme on my title slide that makes me laugh and cry at the same time. Um, 
I am Ula Lechtenberg, uh, the Learning Design Coordinator at the University of Pittsburgh Library System. Uh, my mentor, Helene Gold from the New College of Florida and I gave a version of this presentation at the annual LOEX conference back in May. The theme of that conference was retooling library instruction for today's learning environments. We took it as an opportunity to get our feelings out about LibGuides because we realized that people are talking about the problems with LibGuides without really talking about them. Uh, people have opinions and frustrations, and yet we all still make LibGuides. Um, for example, Pitt has over 500 published guides. How do we manage that? For this ses session today, I am able to spend a little bit more time critically examining our use of this ubiquitous tool. Um, I have lots to say, and I hope we have a great uh, discussion and conversation at the end of my presentation. Before getting all of my feelings out um, about this topic, I would like to give you all the opportunity to do so by playing a little word association game. So when I say libguides, you say, and we're gonna do a Slido. So you could use this QR code um, to open up Slido or go directly to slido.com and enter in the code 1893173. And I'll give it just a minute to get everybody on the same page. And you will see that word association sentence when I say libguides, you say, and you can put in anything and everything uh, that you've ever thought about the platform. Thank you, Darren, for putting that. I think I saw something. I just got a Q&A. Oh, you should see, I see people typing. So I think we're, okay, fiddly. I like that. <laughs> oh, goodness. We're off to a great start. All right, so we have about, it looks like we have 34 participants in our uh, session today. So I'm just gonna give it a little bit of time. I can see the number rising up here. Um, so when we get to that uh, total number, we can, um, start talking about some of these uh, concepts. Six participants typing. <clears throat> All right, so it looks like easy is uh, the most common word that's coming up, which um, I think is absolutely true. I think libguides are really, really easy to use. You don't need to know any special coding or have any special coding skills. Um, you just you know, create a guide and then put a bunch of boxes on it. Um, super easy. Uh, something that's really interesting to me is the expensive. I'm not entirely sure how much uh, the platform costs, although I thought it was relatively inexpensive, but potentially not if your budget is really small, right? Uh, useful if you can't control content on website, and I'm taking that to mean the overall website, like the university website, um, your institutional website, and absolutely, um, you, if you don't have a website otherwise, or you don't have access, then LibGuides is the way to go. Uh, someone did say easy doesn't mean good, <laughs> and I, I definitely agree with that. Uh, weird, 
unfocused, uh, lots of Z's, boring, um, restrictive, and I'd be interested in hearing what you mean by that later. Um, waste of time and time consuming. We make so many guides and then we keep making guides. And then how do we keep up, keep up with that sort of pattern um, if we don't have maintenance in mind? Um, we've got both accessible and inaccessible, uh, which it depends on what content you add into your guide. Um, and I'll talk about a little bit about accessibility. Confusing to navigate, definitely, particularly for our users, our students. Uh, used by librarians more than users, question mark. I think the answer is yes. <laughs> um, uh, information dump, square peg, round hole. So much text. What else do we have here that I didn't see yet? Steal it from somewhere else. I'm, I'm assuming you're telling people to reuse libguides, <laughs> which isn't that kind of the point too, right? There's so many libguides. Why are we reinventing the wheel in certain cases? Uh, dumping ground, totally. I could see that. Um, so it seems like you all, there's one more person typing, um, but it seems like you all have very similar feelings about this platform that I do. Um, so I hope that was a little bit cathartic and I'm definitely going to uh, discuss a lot of these concepts uh, better than PDFs. I suppose that's true. <laughs> uh, okay, let me, all right. After going through much of the existing literature uh, about LibGuides, I've distilled the ideas here in our agenda for today. So I'll talk a little bit about the problems with guides, best practices that align with important elements such as critical pedagogy, web design, and user search behavior. And then to finish the presentation, I'll offer my, my solutions to some of these problems. Um, and then I hope we can have a great discussion after that. Okay, first of all, as you all may have noticed, there are so many libguides. Um, as of last week, there are 878,609 guides according to the LibGuides community page. Last time I checked in mid-April mid in preparation for the previous presentation in May, there were 870,384. So a good around about 8,000 more guides were created in the span of three months. So let's take a moment to break down why there are so many. All kinds of libraries use LibGuides CMS, the content management system, to make their library's website. Uh, this includes public, academic, and special libraries. Um, in some cases, these websites don't look like traditional guides at all uh, with the magic of HTML, CSS, and some scripting. So in the word cloud, someone was mentioning if you don't have access to a larger website, then the LibGuide CMS can really be helpful in creating your own presence as um, an organization, as a library. Uh, some academic libraries do not have control over a website at the university level, so they use LibGuides to make a website. And this is actually not just institutions or organizations that have a subscription to LibGuide CMS. Uh, so there's different, you know, tier system of subscription. LibGuide CMS means you can like make your website, but some uh, organizations will just use a traditional LibGuide as their online presence. So it just looks like a LibGuide. Um, so this relates to that first point I, I was talking about, but it also illustrates how LibGuides act as a space where we have the most control, which is another thing that came up. Um, and then we, as librarians, as a profession, just like to tell people about all of the things. So you put those two together, we get a lot of libguides. In that vein, it also seems like we have a knee-jerk reaction to current events, um, compelling us to create a guide for every issue. So I think this is particularly true over the last few years um, in sort of um, pop culture or political or whatever current event, um, there was a lot of libguides about those things. 
And finally, uh, some real talk <laughs> that might be hard to hear. Uh, and, you know, we can just kind of sit with that discomfort. Uh, are LibGuides tangible proof of value for us as librarians or for libraries in general? If we feel like we need to prove our worth to our bosses, administrators, provosts, chancellors, whoever makes decisions for the library's budget, then what's to stop us from making a lot of guides? Um, I'm not saying everyone does it this way, but it, I think a part of us thinks this way. Um, so all of these points kind of contribute to that proliferation of LibGuides. When the pandemic started, it seemed like these guides were even more useful in an online environment. Uh, did we end up making even more because many of us were working from home full time? Uh, but with so many guides, keeping them up to date is a difficult and onerous task for a single author or creator. Our approach can be kind of one and done. So we create, uh, keep creating new ones without really planning for the ongoing maintenance of them, or we don't plan for the sunsetting of irrelevant guides or deleting of irrelevant guides, so either unpublishing or deleting. Um, so is it really good practice to make guides that are impossible to keep updated for, from our perspective? Um, is that actually good web design or is that learner friendly from our user's perspective? Another question to consider is how do we know if these guides are working? And this was a really interesting um, quote that uh, I read in one of the articles um, and everything will be included in the slide deck, uh, including a, a bibliography. So in their study, Castro, Gessner et al. found that, quote, the strongest sentiment they received about the use of LibGuides was based on faith faith that LibGuides were used and useful for the intended purpose. And I guess I'm not really surprised, although it did stick with me that particular um, quote. Um, guides, as many of us create them, are missing something essential. It's pedagogy. But who can blame us? And I'm not really, I'm not familiar with the iSchool curricula in the UK but many pro programs in the US are missing pedagogy coursework. It is rarely, if ever, a required course. And most often instruction courses are offered as an elective. And that was my experience in graduate school. Uh, it was something I chose to take, the one instruction class that was offered once every academic year and then while I was in school, it just so happened that there was another advanced class that I could take. But in that class, I was one of four students. So not everybody chose to take that class. Uh, so a graduate student may not be uh, aware of how essential teaching is in public service, even asynchronously as through LibGuides. <clears throat> as Brecker and Clipful note in their article, Education Training for Instruction Librarians, a Shared Perspective, quote, it is difficult to help students learn without a basic grounding in the theory and psychology of how students learn, end quote. The LibGuide concept is a modern version of a printed pathfinder, topic-specific reference aids developed at MIT in the 19, early 1970s were specifically designed for the initial stages of library research. The intention was never to create a co comprehensive list of <laughs> sources, but a suggested set of first steps. Oh, look, a list of resources trying to be comprehensive. And so these are a couple of examples from currently published guides, and I am not meaning to pick on any one person or institution, because many authors create lists of links and books in their guides. And I have done this too, all right? Uh, in her article, Allison Hicks claims LibGuides serve as a, quote, decontext decontextualized listing of tools and resources, which isolate researchers from the critical considerations of the context and practices in which they were created, end quote. So essentially, 
isolating researchers from the reading and writing process more generally. Uh, these lists of reference books on shelves and curated lists of websites with icons and no icon key um, in the example on the right. Uh, like, do the students know what that means? Do we know what that means? Um, what those icons mean? <clears throat> they do not meet a learner's immediate research need and mostly serve as a way of demonstrating our resources and maybe our own expertise or authority. But usability studies universally show learners do not browse lists in hopes of finding a relevant resource. So I'm just going to open up the chat. Uh, so these guides that a lot of us are creating are information centered, not learner centered. But you know what, you know, wait a second, there's something about these guides that are so familiar. Join me, if you will, for a trip in the Wayback Machine to 1999 and the Yahoo directory. While the directory no longer exists, we are keeping the spirit alive with the, these lists of resources and lists of links we put in our, our own guides. And if you think about it, librarians have um, used the Pathfinder resource list directory model literally for generations. Before SpringShare's uh, LibGuides sprang into existence in 2007 as their first product, we transitioned from, we librarians, transitioned from creating print pathfinders to creating librarian curated uh, subject guides. So this uh, slide is one of my mentors and uh, co-presenter from the last conference, um, her own pre-SpringShare guides from 1999. So Helene's own usability studies of the library website indicated students were not using them unless they were introduced in a library instruction session and tied to their assignment. So even though students didn't know what they were, what they were, what these guides were, and they weren't using them, librarians were spending a huge amount of time and effort making them. Why? <laughs> These guides were and still are a tangible and very visible way to demonstrate our librarian skills and to show our bosses, colleagues, and the public that we were providing, that Helene and her colleagues were providing resources to support student research. Um, so now with LibGuides, they allow us to assert power and control, such as the library website, as we you know, talked about before, or in other arenas where power dynamics are in play. These early lists weren't as overwhelming as uh, they are now, as they are now, because they, there weren't as many academic websites that professors would allow students to cite or use in their work. But our lists link to other larger lists, which link to mega lists, <laughs> and we're still making lists. <laughs> um, it's kind of funny to think about how the internet got bigger and then sort of contracted to like three websites, but one of them is Google. And that's what students are using uh, a lot of the time. Um, but, but we're still making lists. <laughs> uh, the literature shows that research process guides are more helpful than subject or resources based guides. Research process guides lead to a better uh, to better learning as well as a lessening of anxiety around learning research skills. Several studies show that students prefer pedagogical guides over lists and may learn and retain information literacy concepts better um, overall. The literature is clear and consistent on how to create online research resources uh, and tools that support learning, yet we often find out ourselves using templates or design practices that don't support learning. So this, this slide is an example of a guide's navigation um, that is based on the steps for the final research project for this particular course. Um, 
the layout could be better or it's using a tabbed navigation layout um, could be side navigation and I'll talk about that in a minute um, but a guide like this makes sense to students especially when it's tied to the course that they're taking <clears throat> and that leads me to what should be an essential practice in our profession centering the learner in her article hicks discusses how the traditional approach to creating libguides is very much a like a banking model of learning she writes quote in creating libguides that define research through its resources we unconsciously reinforce academic power dynamics limit dialogue and marginalize the student voice from the very academic conversations that surround them. This also centers the professional librarian's existence on an assumption of student ignorance, a particularly insulting observation, end quote. So how do we center the learner in a libguide? By teaching from them, with them and to them. We should use instructional design best practices to de develop guides for a specific purpose. And I was recently talking with my colleagues um, at the Pitt Libraries about um, sort of how you go about creating a libguide um, from idea to the mechanics of you know, adding boxes and all that. And I started with this idea of creating to a real versus imagined audience. So a real audience would be, there is a need because you know a faculty member is teaching a class and they would like a, a guide that's related to their course, um, or there are common reference questions that are coming up about a topic. So you create a guide to sort of um, embed them in reference interactions. And an imagined audience is when we sort of honestly make work for ourselves. So we say, oh, this would be really interesting to make a guide about, but we don't really know that there's an audience for that. And so that's really making more work for us in creating those guides. And it isn't being learner centered because we're, we're not, we don't know those learners. We haven't found them They're, They don't exist. They're an imagined audience. Um, so user-centered studies recommend that guides be introduced in uh, an instruction session. LMS or learning management uh, system integration is incredibly important. Students will have the guide in their course at the time of the research need. Um, and LibGuides, SpringShare makes this pretty easy. Uh, if you have sort of that tier uh, subscription where you can actually link uh, your guides or even your A to Z databases list directly into Canvas courses or Blackboard or whatever your learning management system is. Um, so they're just automatically there. They, students will see them and they'll use them because they're in the environment, the learning management environment that they're kind of spending most of their time in. Conrad and Stevens write, quote, a guide designed as an instructional tool to teach specific concepts, topic generation processes, search strategies, citation practices, et cetera, within the context of a specific assignment for a specific course may well be immediately perceived as relevant to students in that course. Such a guide discussed in the context of a class might also be perceived more useful than guides consisting of lists of resources and tools, which are unlikely to be interpreted as helpful by students who stumble upon them while seeking research assistance on the library's website." End quote. Uh, students can create a LibGuide as a final project or course assessment and an alternative to the research paper. This is something that I know um, my mentor Helene does a lot. She teaches uh, specific classes um, at her institution. And so I know that a lot of us uh, as librarians in you know, academic uh, spaces aren't teaching semester long um, term long courses. And so it's sort of hard to create an assignment that is uh, a LibGuide for students. Um, but it is 
it could be a talking point potentially with professors and other teaching uh, faculty to sort of get them to start thinking about their students producing um, knowledge in different ways outside of the research paper. So this particular practice of creating libguides uh, centers, students creating the libguides, I should say, uh, centers the learner. They're totally in the middle, they're in control. And then it helps you discuss uh, student needs and options with, student, with uh, professors and teaching faculty and incorporates elements of open pedagogy, especially if you start building um, on previous student work, the sharing of student work across terms, across semesters, what have you. So again, not everyone can achieve this, but if you can, if you can try it out, I think it would be a great experience for everybody involved. So shifting gears a little bit <laughs> to another element of good uh, libguide creation um, to talk about the role of web, uh, web design or lack thereof, honestly. <laughs> As mentioned earlier in the presentation, LibGuides is only a new tool that helped ease the transition of old pathfinders to an online environment. Some librarians were able to create online guides before LibGuides as illustrated by Helene's screenshots from 1999. But in 2007, everything moved towards this platform because it was generally affordable for libraries and easy to use. Um, and I suppose in the middle of this presentation, it's important for me to say that I don't really, I don't have anything against Springshare. <laughs> I think LibGuides are a, a good platform. Um, you don't need to know HTML uh, or any coding to make a LibGuide. And that's great. Um, there are many positive aspects of this tool, including that many libraries are able to have a website as we, um, discussed during the word cloud, uh, but it's, it's interesting to think about. Um, despite all the literature, advice, and best practices available to us, collectively, we still seem to forget that libraries are still just a website. So in Bergstrom Lynch, uh, they talk about how usability studies indicated that students find online library guides difficult to use because of issues related to the amount of content, unclear, inconsistent, or confusing terminology, and the look and feel of guides. So what does this mean? When we center the information, we are essentially moving the print version of a Pathfinder um, to the web. So call it a Pathfinder, a bibliography, whatever. We are trying to put a square peg in a round hole. Uh, which also came up during the word cloud. <laughs> uh, because what might work for print does not work for the web. Making libguides really difficult to use for our users, for our students. Um, and again, I've been guilty of this too. Before learning about how people learn and what makes for good web design, I made libguides that were the definition of information overload. Determining the purpose of the guide, centering the learner, and following good web design practices helps me create a better uh, learning experience for students, for my users. So with the fact that libraries are websites, or libguides are websites, excuse me, comes the standard things we should all be doing when creating them. Uh, so Goodset and her colleagues uh, reviewed all best practices in a literature review and compiled a list of recommend recommendations um, to follow. First of all, write for the web. So this means limit the amount of text, be concise, use bulleted lists to break up large blocks of text and really use white space. Um, Reading a bunch of text online on the screen is really hard for a lot of people. Um, so even if you have a lot of information, break it up. <laughs> um, appearance. When it comes to appearance, you want a uniform font 
color, layout, labels, language. So this is kind of across all of your guides uh, within a, your particular library organization. If everything kind of looks the same, the, the experience will be common for students. They'll know what to expect when they, they find one, they know what to expect from another. And side navigation over tabbed layout. Usability studies have shown that side navigation uh, is much better than tabbed layout. And I don't think they, we don't use this terminology or this uh, concept anymore, but the at the beginnings of the internet, we talked about banner blindness. So uh, banners at the top of the page were almost always ads. So uh, over time, we figured out we don't need to look at the top because that's just going to be an ad. And even though, and like, you know, the internet's a little bit different, web design is a little bit different, that, that tab layout kind of calls back to that banner blindness. So it all kind of looks just like the top of the, he the header of the page. And so people don't know to look at the tabs to navigate. So the side navigation makes it much clearer. With content, um, list resources in order of importance, not alphabetically. So um, I'm not sure if you've done this, but I've done this. <laughs> when you look at your statistics uh, of your LibGuides, the homepage or the getting started, the, the first page that anyone would go to uh, on your guide has the most views. And then when you look at every subsequent page, other page on your, your guide, the numbers get much, much smaller. So we should be putting all of the most important information on that first page because it's less, it's not likely that students will navigate to the other pages. So if, if we want them to know something very important, it should be right there. Chunk information into smaller pieces. So uh, you know, you might, this is like web design, but it's also a little bit of pedagogy. Uh, we don't really absorb a lot of information all at once. So if you chunk information down into smaller uh, bite-sized pieces, then they're easier to digest and easier to kind of retain. Um, so again, if you have a lot of information, you wanna present it in, in a way that's good for the web, um, but also in sort of a logical way that's like, group together in smaller chunks. So be student friendly, no jargon. Or if you have to use jargon for whatever reason, you wanna make sure that you're defining it um, in that moment, wherever it, wherever it is. Uh, the F pattern of importance kind of speaks to that side navigation a little bit. Um, when uh, usability studies have shown that when we're looking at a website, we're looking at an, an F pattern. So we kind of look down the side, the left-hand side, and then we go across the top and then across the middle. It's sort of backwards on the camera, but you get it. It looks like an F. <laughs> um, so that helps because people are not reading websites word for word, we're skimming. Um, so we're skimming in that pattern to see where we need to go, what we need to read. Another way of thinking about it um, that I read about is a layer cake uh, layout. <laughs> so using headers to uh, illustrate what's uh, in that particular section. Um, so, you know, again, your eye is skimming across one header, the second, the third, and it's a layer cake um, so that people can kind of uh, see all at once and then going back and focusing on whatever they think is most important for them. Okay, accessibility. This is a big one. And honestly, Springshare uh, does a, a pretty good job uh, in making LibGuides accessible. But what we put in our LibGuides also, we need to consider accessibility. Um, so for example, if you're going to embed any videos, you wanna make sure that those are captioned or that they have subtitles um, for different learner preferences. Um, or if possible, you could also have uh, a transcript linked uh, underneath that video so that someone who doesn't want to watch it can read the script. 
or do both at, at the same time if that's what they prefer. Uh, all click here links need to be descriptive text um, for the link location. So if you're kind of used to putting the link in the words, click here, it is nonsense to someone who is using a screen reader. Um, so you really want to be putting the link in the descriptive part. So um, if you have an example would be uh, for library hours, click here. So that's bad. <laughs> you want to you want to put the link under library hours because that is descriptive to what that link is going to. Uh, do not rely on color for meaning. People are colorblind. Um, so if you are using color to convey anything important, um, don't, <laughs> because people will not understand that. Um, so if you have to use color, make sure that you're always also using an, another, um, maybe like a pattern on that color to distinguish. So if it has to be red, do like lines on that red to distinguish that that particular thing um, you know, denotes whatever. Um, so overall, we're just trying to make sure that guides can be easily read by a screen reader. Um, and you can test this out. There's a lot of uh, uh, desktop apps that you can download um, to test this out, but there's also browser extensions where you can test this out. And if you've never used a screen reader, it can be kind of overwhelming or feel kind of chaotic at first, but it's so important that we're like making resources, guides for all of our users. So um, in their article, Bergstrom Lynch also reiterate uh, these points and advocate using the ADI model of instructional design to create LibGuides. So this is combining user-centered and learner-centered design principles. Elements of good web design uh, work hand in hand with our user search behavior. So the, it, we talk about something being above the fold. Um, so that re re is regarding newspapers above the fold, but also in LibGuides. So it is recommended that most relevant database links be placed at the landing page since research indicates that uh, the homepage and databases page receive the heaviest use and that students ex expect to find the most important information under the home tab. Um, I think scrolling, it used to be that people didn't scroll. I think people scroll a lot more now or are used to scrolling, um, but you still wanna put that main information at the top because people want that information right there. <laughs> uh, visual clutter is a primary problem, re which results in too much text, too many tabs, too many databases and links. So clean and simple is the student preference. Keeping guides simple is, uh, and easy to read will allow students to absorb um, the information that is useful to them. I still wonder <laughs> whether students are coming to our websites and just stumbling onto our guides. Um, a lot of the research says no. Most guides are underused because of a gap in the way librarians present information and the way the user interacts with information. And with our students, every search box is Google. So. Welcome to the Googleverse. Um, search boxes on any page uh, allow users to assert independence from the site's attempt at guiding them and can be used as an escape hatch when stuck in navigation. Uh, this is not how I interact with the internet, but a lot of our students do so because they are search dominant. So students prefer to search for information rather than browsing a guide. Uh, Olet found that students do not use subject guides, or at least not in, unless it is a last result, resort. Reasons provided for non-use included not knowing that they existed, <laughs> preferring to search the open web, and not perceiving a need to use them. We seem to be inherently at odds with our students because of different mental models regarding both the research process and disciplines as subjects um, or subjects. Castro, Gessner et al. discuss how, uh, 
quote, librarians' mental models lead them to create a container of resources that emulates the stages of the information search process. Students' mental models focus less on the process and more on the product of the research, end quote. While it is pedagogically sound to organize research guides around the research process, scoping it is important. Course-related guides make more sense to students because of their focus on the end product. But we still make a ton of other guides <laughs> that are not for specific courses, and who do we expect um, to use them? Our students don't think about subjects when conducting research or completing assignments. And I was, I was thinking back to when I was an undergraduate, or you think about any um, student new to college or university, and to expect them to understand academic subjects or like really be familiar with them is really unreasonable. I didn't know when I got into college, it took years of being in school to really understand um, these subjects and disciplines or their differences. Uh, analysis of user search patterns re reveal that organizing guides around disciplines is at odds with students' mental models for gathering information. Since our students are not browsers, our library users rarely search by subject to find LibGuide get LibGuide's content because that does not fit their mental model for how to uh, find the information they are seeking. Okay, so what do we do about this? Business Cat has some official recommendations. Actually follow best practices. And this is something kind of interesting that I've been thinking about. Um, there is a lot of literature about usability, good web design, um, and it seems like we still, as a profession, we still struggle with implementing these things. And to be fair, there is some conflicting information about specific aspects of guides. Um, in that one uh, literature review of best practices, they did discover that there is some conflicting information about what like is the most useful in web design, in the design of LibGuides. But overall, there are many, lib, uh, many elements that are common especially when it comes to web design. So we should really be following those best practices for good web design, because again, LibGuides are websites. So the next recommendation is to center the learner and you can focus on the research process or skills required for the class or assignment. And it sort of ties together with the third point, which is to embed course um, or assignment guides directly into the learning management system. And this can be done with that LTI tool that I de described earlier. If you have that, if your institution, your organization has that subscription of LibGuides, but you can also, you know, try to get it in the learning management system otherwise. And some of us I know um, try to be embedded in the learning management system. So if you have access to a discussion board or a section of the course, you could put the, the information in there, a link to the LibGuide in there, because our students are spending a lot of time there uh, when it comes to their coursework. And um, I know a lot of folks will then also teach to their guides in the instruction session. So instead of a PowerPoint, for example, having the uh, LibGuide in an instruction session and telling the students, I made this for you, this is relevant to this class, let's go, let's talk about what's in here as sort of a show and tell. But you can also incorporate elements of active learning within LibGuides, especially if you have access to uh, LibWizard forms or quizzes um, and you can do, instead of doing a paper worksheet, you could do something like that in the, in the LibGuide as well. Uh, and my final point is maybe the hardest thing for us to do, but if you take anything away from today, uh, I kind of hope it's this one where you're willing to say no. Um, do you, can you think about answering the question, like, do you need to make a guide for that, whatever that is? 
And if you can also answer the question like, this is the best way to reach our students. This is the way that I am centering the learner. This is the way that I can really make a difference then make that LibGuide. But if you can't answer those questions uh, affirmatively, <laughs> then maybe don't, don't make the LibGuide. Uh, and I sort of think about it as like, is it a LibGuide that could have been an email? Like, can you add your list of links to, again, the learning management system? And I can see that uh, it's a VLE in certain institutions. We have Canvas or Blackboard or Moodle. Um, I'm not familiar with the ones that uh, institutions in the UK use, but thank you, Darren. Um, so yeah, is it is it is the LibGuide that it could have been an email? Can you just send those links of any other way? And a final thought from Maria Accardi before we open up our discussion. Put down that LibGuide right now. Let's chat. <laughs> That was great. Thank you so much, Ula. I've been keeping an eye on the chat and there haven't been any specific questions, but okay. I did want to say just not to spoil my talk, which is after this, but I think there's a lot of overlap between what you've been saying and what I will be saying um, in about reading lists and reading list systems. And I think there's, um, you know, reading lists are often sort of seen as or promoted as a pedagogical tool, for example, and they're not really. They're just a list, <laughs> you know, if they're used and embedded into classes, you know, mm -hmm. like you're talking about with LibGuides, they could be a pedagogical tool, but uh, they, they're not used as, as that really, are they? They're just lists for students to refer to. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the other thing uh, that, that popped up for me while you were talking that was um, often, I think, with LibGuides and with reading lists as well, um, we come to the conclusion that there's some kind of there's something wrong with the people using them um so we're kind of like oh but why aren't students doing this we want them to use our live guys we want them to use our reading lists um and you know uh, we often solve that by saying you know we need to engage them more and we need to um do more promotion of these things um and i think you know like you've just talked about you know that isn't probably the right the right conclusion to be coming to it's it should right. be more about querying what we're doing mm -hmm. and whether that fits in with them rather than why aren't they fitting in with us yeah yeah definitely more of an asset based approach rather than deficit based right um mm. our student you know we are here to teach our students um but they also come to us with a lot of their own uh, learning experiences, uh, knowledge about different things. And yeah, they're just engaging in a way that we're not necessarily used to. Um, and I, I'm always about like meeting the learner, the student where they are. So if they're using Google to search, let's start there and let's talk about like what is different between a Google search and searching a library database. Um, and I think that's way more that can be way more effective than just being like, well, you should, <laughs> or why don't you? Um, the other thing is I do feel like as a profession, I, I feel maybe I should say personally, like I'm screaming into the void sometimes of like, why don't people know about these things? We tell them all the time and that's just not healthy. So definitely looking at it more like, okay, where is the user? Where is the learner? How can I meet them or meet them halfway where they are? Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, we've got a couple of questions in here. So um, number one, how does the idea of making a guide for each course slash assignment square with the idea of not making too many guides or having too many to manage? I like the idea of them, but it seems lots of work. Yes. And the solution, I guess the solution isn't 
don't make subject guides, but make all the course guides, I think we have to be discerning about where that they are going to be most effective. Um, so if you're going to make a guide, try to make it specific to courses or coursework or assignments. But even then, like, do you need a guide to help you in instructing uh, information literacy concepts around the assignment or around that course? So it's sort of like um, maybe like a decision tree or a flow chart that we need to kind of make for ourselves where there's options and we don't, it's not like we're not replacing one with the other because it is a lot of work. Um, the only benefit, honestly, in terms of making course guides is they can be reused for that course as long as the instructor sort of keeps you up to date on what they're changing. Um, so the maintenance is what you're doing rather than the completely new creation of guides. Um, so that's sort of my perspective. It's not the, it's not moving from one thing to the other completely. It's a lot more nuanced and making that decision and the practicing of saying no, or like, well, I'm not gonna make this, this guide, but like, you know, sometimes a handout, I know we didn't like PDFs, sometimes a handout is okay. <laughs> or sometimes an email to the professor is okay. Um, and like sort of being open to the possibility outside of LibGuides is, and I, I hope that answers that question. I don't think there's other questions in the chat. It's more sort of comments, but um, Ula, you did mention to me earlier if people wanted to unmute themselves to talk, that's also okay. So if anybody wants to either pop their hand up or unmute themselves uh, just to say what they've said in the chat or ask any questions or comment on something, please do feel free to do that as well. There's a question from Darren about co-creation of content for guides from students, um, like then providing what sections headings should go in. Uh, I, Helene was the one that had specific ex, uh, experience with LibGuides. I have worked with students in other platforms on co-creation. Um, and I was really there just as like, a guide for the faculty, for the professor in that class um, to help them um, guide their students. But the, you know, the, the assignment itself was created by that faculty member. Um, the students had to work in groups on creating this um, resource, external public resource for social work um, resources in um, the area of Connecticut where I was living at the time and working. And so the students came together, they picked specific topics within um, a list that the professor had uh, described. And then so those topics served as the way that that online resource was organized. Um, and they, com they like completed the content or they added the content. And of course, the professor vetted everything and read and um, made sure that the links were working and made sure that everything was like relevant to that topic. Um, but that would be an example of my experience helping students create online content for an assignment. And with Helene, she she, I think she allows students sort of free reign in terms of what they do. Um, she teaches an intro to academic librarianship class. So it's very um, specific niche. <laughs> um, and the students can, you know, they think of a thesis or an important topic uh, within academic librarianship and they do the research as though they were writing a research uh, paper 
but instead of writing the research paper, they have their like annotated bibliography right on the guide. Um, they have an introduction right on the guide. So it's like almost using the sections of a research paper as the headings for the, the boxes on the LibGuides. Uh, we've got a, another question. So what processes do people use when reviewing guides? So e.g. deciding when, what content to change, or even deciding to remove guides slash pages that aren't getting a lot of use. So any, any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I, that's something that I'm trying to facilitate at my own institution at the Pitt Libraries. Um, so we have a model where we have a LibGuides review team, uh, and I, I took over leadership of this team last year. And this is a group of people who are sort of like power users of LibGuides, so they've been using them for a really long time. And we don't, so people submit their guides for review, but we're not reviewing for content, we're reviewing for usability essentially, right? Are they using the links correctly, the content types correctly? Is there any weird formatting, that kind of stuff. Um, so that's kind of like the base level of everyone is sort of on the same page, the look and feel is there. What I am trying to implement, uh, my, first, uh, my first project in regards to your question specifically, is um, to focus on course guides. And essentially what I would like to do, I don't think people will like me, but that's fine. I, the LibGuides review team will unpublish all course guides at the end of each term. And it is up to the LibGuides author to make sure that the information is up to date if that course is being taught in the following semester. Uh, if it is not being taught in the following semester, then we will encourage people to keep it unpublished. Because is it relevant if that class is it being taught? Um, I've already had some people say, well, what if the, the course is taught every semester? That's even more important for things to be relevant, up to date, in line with the professor's teaching, right? Um, that's what I'm going to tell people. <laughs> And I think it's true. I'm not making that up. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I haven't really, I'm working on like documentation and policy for that. Um, you know, documentation isn't going to save us, but it's going to help. <laughs> the, so that's kind of like the first step that I've thought of in terms of kind of getting people to be more engaged with the guides that they have created, um, especially around courses. Other guides is um, that's probably going to take a couple more years uh, leading this particular group. But um, for the future, I thought about looking at the guides holistically. Like, like I said, Pitt has over 500. So looking at it more broadly, and we what sort of makes it even more difficult is we have um, five campuses, campus libraries. So each campus, some of the stuff. Uh, relates to the entire library system and other things are relevant only to each campus. So looking at it more holistically and saying like, well, what are the things, what are the guides that should be, that we have that relate to everybody? And if there are duplicate or sort of extraneous, I suppose, guides that say the same thing, let's come together and make one guide about that topic or that subject um, that applies to everyone, um, regardless of their campus. Um, the other thing that we do is we have a um, auto update boxes. So anything that is common, like your library catalog, um, discovery search, how ILL works, anything that's common to the system in general, we have boxes that are on um, a separate LibGuides page and people are encouraged to take from those boxes and just um, map them to their guides so that if changes are made, we make them in that like master box list, uh, guide and then that those changes will be reflected everywhere else. So that sort of helps with maintenance of those like 
um, organization, organization specific things. Um, I hope that helps. I don't know. <laughs> I just uh, one of the things you said that one of the things that I rail against in my library is this notion of consistency and like the the libguides powers that be in my library like to say it, on everyone's guides there needs to be x y and z and my argument is that you know there doesn't necessarily need to be x y and z because you know uh, one of my aerospace engineering students isn't also going to be looking at say the English libguide so why do why does that why do you need to mandate that level of consistency? So mm. what, what, what do you think about that? Um, well, we, I suppose it's not, those, the, those auto update boxes are very specific. So we're, if someone in engineering isn't going to use um, something that's relevant to English, like they don't have to use those boxes, right? And then in terms of like the consistency of, it's more about like the look and feel and the functionality, consistent functionality rather than the consistent, like not every guide needs to have the A to Z list or whatever. Um, it, it can be tailored to each guide, to whatever that guide is about, but in terms of how students experience those guides, it should be relatively consistent. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Um, we've also got another question here about, are there any things you've seen on the guides that you've never put in one of yours? <laughs> um, Without, you know, calling out people on their specific guides, I guess. <laughs> I, okay, so here's something that's also very specific to my institution, um, but maybe it's true for some of you. Um, the library does have a website that um, the internal web services and communications team uh, does have access to. But for some reason, it's like really complicated to get anything updated on there. Um, so a lot of our guides um, at the Pitt Library sort of act as static web pages that should reside on the library's website, main website, but through what, you know, whatever. I'm relatively new. I just still don't understand what's going on. Um, but so through the lack of like access, direct access to the to the website, they've just made the guides. So in my perspective, like, I don't want to put anything that really shouldn't, that's like, um, that should be on the library's website. Um, and I guess when I, I haven't actually had to make a lot of guides in this position, <laughs> thankfully, sort of. Um, but when I, if I needed to do something like that, I think I would try to get it on the library's website as much as possible. Um, that's sort of very specific to, to our institution. Other things, I really, if I'm going to list, oh, I will not put links, like a list of links to other websites, like organizational websites or association. Like if someone, is wants to like connect with the business association or the engineering association, they're not going to come to a libguide to go do that. They're going to Google that association. <laughs> so things like that, that like isn't necessarily relevant or doesn't jive with user behavior, search behavior. I'm not gonna put that in there. Yeah, that's a really good one. Uh, we've also got um, Darren really hates the new books section on a guide, which fair enough. And also Angie says she hates any class guide to how the classification system works. Mm. Yeah. Uh, I've got another question. I often think about the amount of duplication of effort out there, like how many EndNote database guides are currently out there, mm -hmm. mainly because of the product owner developers don't make good enough guides. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts about how we could collaborate in the future? And do you think this would be realistic? 
That is such a good question. I think, I mean, wasn't that the purpose of the LibGuides community page or site? Um, I don't know if you all have seen this before. Uh, this is where I got those statistics um, from the beginning of my presentation. So here it is. Just someone put it in there. So this is a link to the community, LibGuides community. Um, and the way that I understand this is you you can find someone's guide who like on like the topic or subject or whatever that they, that you really like and you would like to you know copy with attribution or whatever um and so i thought that that this is this could help um but instead of sort of one <laughs> guide to rule them all about endnote or whatever um it's individual instances. And I think this mar might, it's twofold, right? Like it is that particular, each individual instance is servicing or trying to service uh, and speak to a different student population or a different population in general. So you might want, you might like the way someone describes EndNote, but you wanna like make a certain point for your individual population. So there's that. But I think the other thing is, you know, wanting to, it's that proof of value, maybe not like consciously, but it's like, oh, I'm going to make this guide on EndNote and then I can point to it. And I don't know, I we don't, um, our guides are not counted towards promotion um, or reappointment or anything like that, but maybe in some places they are and that's what's happening um so i don't know that there is necessarily a, a solution i think it would take a lot i think it would have to potentially come from spring share themselves themselves but they're probably not going to encourage that because of individual subscriptions or whatever Right, yeah, it probably makes them feel good and look good if they've got nearly a million lip guides out there. So, so many. So many. I, I, I didn't look too much. I had this thought, like, does that total number include private guides? I would venture to say no. And we do, like, a lot of us use private guides, you know, that they're, they're available online, but they're not, like, easily accessible from your website. So if you just like want certain people to look at it, you send them the link. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure there's a lot more private guides that are not included in that number. Yeah, I'm wondering as well about, um, we have created backups for all of our guides as well, which obviously aren't openly visible. So that mm -hmm. would also increase the number potentially. Yeah, I don't think they're not gonna include unpublished guides, but private, uh, I don't think is included in that number either. So yeah, that's ent entirely possible. Um, I was wondering as well. So I'm an absolute good guide skeptic, but I have, <laughs> I'm sort of surrounded by people that either aren't bothered or really like them for whatever reason. So what would you think, or what have you done maybe to try and sort of help people become a bit more skeptical or help them understand that the guides could be done in a better way? Yeah, I am on that journey. Um, uh, so it's still very early. I don't know if I've ever, I've convinced anyone about this, but I do, I do use these talking points, right? So earlier I talked about like uh, we had a, a 30 minute training a couple of weeks ago where it's like, how do you set up your LibGuide? But before I even went into that, right, the, the technical aspects of that, I said, how do you decide how to make a LibGuide? And that's when I talked about, you know, your real audience versus your imagined audience. Um, because I think, and, and like talking about it in terms of we're all very busy and making guides and not like really factoring your maintenance can 
end up being a lot of work. So can you focus your efforts on that real audience, the direct ask that you have from somebody for a guide rather than just making one because you think something is cool. And I think we think lots of things are cool <laughs> in libraries. Like we get excited to talk about things, we get excited to share, but do we really wanna put that in the LibGuide form? So I've started sort of peppering <laughs> trainings with that sort of um, logic, reasoning, uh, for people to kind of take a step before even making anything, take a step, take a moment and say, okay, who is this for? Who's the audience? What purpose is this for? And if I can't answer it in a way that's really worth my time in the long run, um, then maybe I don't make it. I don't know if that's going to work, but that's one way. <laughs> um, and then I found in terms of in the literature, the um the usability testing i think is useful but anytime any of the literature that said like we don't know that this is working you know like we're making these things and we're sort of that one uh quote about like we have faith that it's useful um and so maybe introducing people not necessarily to, to that quote specifically but if you could organize some sort of like journal club, or if you have professional development time, um, like uh, staff meetings or what have you, and you can read an article together, potentially introducing people to that, those like limitations of who's using our guides and are they actually useful, that might open people's eyes up. Because something that I wonder, I, I like to I do try to keep up on literature, not necessarily only on libguides, but like teaching and pedagogy. And so I don't know if other people have the time or um, realize that, you know, that could be part of something that they do to keep up to date, um, to understand best practices and to understand um, kind of what's happening in the library world, in the research that's being done. Um, again, not a solution necessarily, but potentially a door, a way to open the door. Great, thank you. Darren? I was just putting my camera on ready for when we go for a break in a moment. <laughs> so we can show it to people. Um, you carry on, we've got a minute or two. Any other questions that we didn't talk about? This is a very active chat. I appreciate that. <laughs> yes, I didn't mean to make anyone feel old <laughs> with the Yahoo directory. I, I think I think we loved it. I'm I'm on a deep dive into. Trying to find a Carter somewhere. Yeah, and, oh and my yeah, gosh. <laughs> and trying to find the Carter Discovery game. Uh, oh, wow. Yes. Wow. Very good. <laughs> I mean, we're all about nostalgia, aren't we? <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I, I feel like it could almost fit in with a sort of Stranger Things retro vibe. It's a bit later, it's 95, but you know. Yeah. I mean, Y2K fashion is in, so we're yeah. there. <laughs> Ask Jeeves or Clippy. Do you all remember Clippy from Microsoft Word? Uh, no? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> there's a there's a FE quote, isn't there, in Hunger Games? Everything old can be made new again. And there you go. I sincerely believe that. <laughs> uh, um, well, I think we've, well, we've just come to 20 past, um, and I think we've come to a bit of a natural close there. Um, so I'm just going to ask everybody in uh, the chat or via reaction, just to respect for, um, for presenting to us, um, for Ulla presenting to us. It was a really great session. Really enjoyed it. You got on early, <laughs> and it's been great. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much. This was fun. I really appreciate <laughs> the opportunity to get my feelings out. I, I don't know. We don't we don't have the answers, but we can start, you know, changing people's minds about things. <laughs>
Excellent, I totally agree. Um, right, so we're going to take a break here because it's important that we all rest our eyes um, and rest our brains for a bit. So we're going to take a break until um, half past three, and then we're going to be moving on to our next session uh, from Michelle. Uh, I would advise that you go and look at a tree or look at some water or the sky, uh, so you're not looking at the screen. If you can't move away from your computer, uh, I'm going to give you a link